We've been blessed with good music all week long. Amen. That was good. I enjoyed that. I haven't heard, heard a harmonica played like that for a long time. That was great. I have a favor to ask of you, but only if you can and only if you want to. Is that fair? <laughs> and the favor is, is that they have asked me at 11 o'clock to present the devotional that I presented to the pastors in the Stone Chapel, at 11 o'clock in the Stone Chapel. And they want to record it because they didn't record the devotionals, but they want to record it. And I don't like to speak to the air. And so if any of you have that slot free, if you're not locked into some other thing or some other place, if you would show up at the Stone Chapel, even if it's only two or three of you, at least I would feel like there was somebody to talk to. So if you want to work that out, that would be great. 11 o'clock at the Stone Chapel. Uh, what's that? Yeah, good, good clarification. Thank you. That's, no, no problem. Uh, there was a little boy, three years old, who was not really particularly enjoying church that day. You ever known any three-year-olds that just have a hard time with church sometimes? And this little boy was getting pretty fussy, and mom and dad were doing everything they could think of. They had coloring books. They had quiet books. They had everything that they could think of, and they, the warnings got more and more severe, and, and uh, everything fell apart when he pulled the hair of the little girl in front of him. <clears throat> So dad gets up, picks up his son, and starts marching out. And when they get back to the back of the, of the church, the little boy calls out in a loud voice, Please pray for me! <laughs> he needed intercessory prayer at that point. I want to talk with you about that this morning, about praying for people. I've had... I wasn't, to be honest with you, I wasn't really sure at the beginning of the week which Bible study I would do with you this morning. And I was praying about it, but through the week, several of you have made it clear that you wanted to hear this particular subject. And so I would like to speak with you about intercessory prayer. And we're going to talk about praying for people who are, who are sick and what to do. And if people don't get well, if they die then how should we relate to that? How can we make sense of that? We're also going to talk about praying for people who need Jesus. And that's what intercessory prayer is. It means praying for other people. Praying for God to help other people. Intercessory prayer. So if you brought your Bible with you, we're going to review a couple of verses. We've looked at this one a lot through the week because Jesus is our example. And he, it says, ever lives to make intercession for us. He believes, Jesus believes, that praying for other people is important and that it makes a difference. Certainly, Jesus wouldn't waste his time doing something if it didn't make a difference. I've had people through the years, periodically, not all the time, but once in a while someone will say, does it really make a difference to pray for other people? Yes, it absolutely does. It makes a big difference in people's lives. In John chapter 17, verse 20, in that verse, Jesus says, Father, I don't just pray for these, speaking of his disciples, but I pray for all of those who will believe on me through their word. So when I look at that verse, I see Jesus praying what I like to call a blanket prayer. He's praying for a large group of people all at once. And in this case, he was praying for people who weren't even born yet. He's saying, I'm praying for all of those who are going to believe on me through their word. So he included you and me in that prayer. And of course, Jesus is praying for you by name to the Father on a regular basis, on a daily basis, because he loves you and he wants you to be saved. Well, then there's this other verse that we looked at earlier in the week, too. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 4, in which it says, if you look at verse 4, I don't know if you have it there in front of you, but if you turn real quick back there to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, yesterday we mentioned that he says, prayer is the most important thing you can do in your life. And then he talks about praying for kings and for people in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. And then he ends in verse 4 by saying, and that they may be saved. So here the Bible says that the means of someone's salvation comes through prayer. I can remember praying for this person and that person through the years that, that they would find Jesus, that Jesus would come into their life. And I have seen miraculous things happen. One lady in particular, she was very depressed. I met her at a camp meeting many years ago. 
Her grandmother said, would you please visit with her? I said, yes, I would be glad to do that. And as I sat down and visited with her, it was exceedingly clear that she was very depressed. And I said to her, I'm going to pray for you. I, and I don't make this, com I can't make this commitment to everybody, but I was impressed to make this commitment to her. And I said, I will pray for you every single day. And I will continue to be in contact with your family to see how you're doing. I'm going to pray for you every day. And she said, well, if you want to, you know, she was very depressed, you know. So I did. I prayed for her every day. And I prayed that God would open the way for her to see how much he loved her, that God would restore to her a zest for life and a purpose for living. I prayed that if there were, if there were evil spirits who were especially singling her out, that, that the blood of Jesus would be lifted up against them and that they would be driven from her presence. And I prayed that the light of God would shine upon her path and that she could see through the dark and the gloom. So I prayed that way for her every day. As the Lord would have it, I received an invitation from a church up in the area where she lived, and I didn't know that that was where she lived when I accepted that invitation, but I went there, and when I went there, the third night I was there, there she was sitting in, in the church, and she was looking as bright as can be, as bright as a new copper penny. She was looking really bright. And so after the meeting was over, she said, can I speak to you? And I said, yes. And she said this to me. She said, I don't know how to explain it, she said, but I'm not depressed anymore. She says, I'm off my meds, and I'm happy. I'm doing good. And so immediately in my mind, I knew other people were praying for her too. And in my mind, I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus, for hearing all of our prayers on behalf of this girl. And then she looked at me, and she said, can you please tell me how to accept Jesus as my Savior? And so I had the privilege of leading her to accept Jesus as her Savior. And then from that point on, she began to go out, and she was such a witness. She went out sharing her testimony all over that conference, because a lot of people had known how sick she was. And so now here she was telling people how Jesus had set her free from this terrible, dark depression she was in, and it was a very powerful testimony. Now this, this next story I want to tell you is absolutely true. You may not think it's true, but it is true. It's true to the very detail. I went to a new church, and the very first prayer meeting I was there, this lady came to me and she said, uh, would you please pray for my husband? And I said, sure, what, what do I need to pray about? She said, well, he's an atheist. And she said, I am really hoping that he will give his life to Jesus. She said, will you pray for him? I said, yes. And of course, she had asked other people to pray for him, and, and the church knew him, and they were praying for him. Every Wednesday night, back in 1995, we were praying for this man. Now, you remember in 1995, they, uh, they launched Net95 with Mark Finley speaking to the nation, to the, to the churches of, you know, of our country, and we all put satellite dishes, or I guess most of us did, put satellite dishes on our church, which now have become ornaments, you know, because most people don't use them anymore. But, but at the time, they were important, and so we were using these, this as a means to try to reach people in our community. So... Uh, she said, one Wednesday night, she said, now this Friday night, Net 95 is going to happen on Friday night. She's going to start. And she said, I'm going to ask my husband if he'll sit down and watch it with me. She had shared with us that he was a, an, an intolerable, almost, TV addict, that he was just so addicted to his TV. He was semi-retired, and he had a lot of extra time on his hands. And so he, would, he bought the best satellite. He bought the best TV. He bought the best stereo system. I mean, he had the, the best audio, video thing you could have of his time. And there it was in his living room. I remember visiting them and seeing this elaborate setup that he had there. So he, he was really addicted to his TV. So she said to us on that Wednesday night, could we please make his case a special case of prayer because on, on Thursday I'm going to ask him if he will watch Net95 with me on Friday night. She said, he's always been so resistant to spiritual things. So we said, yes, we will do that. So we prayed. We prayed earnestly. We spent a lot of time praying for him that night. The next day, she goes to him and she says, sweetheart, she says, you know, I know that your TV is important to you, and I know that, that you like to watch it a lot. And, and she said, I don't complain to you about that. She said, you, you asked me to sit down and watch programs with you, and she said, I'm happy to do that because I want to spend time with you. She said, I've never, almost never asked you to watch anything with me. He said, that's true. She said, I'm, I'm asking you to watch something with me tomorrow night. Would you be willing to watch something with me tomorrow night? 
Now, you know, Friday night for people who watch TV is a big night, a lot of stuff on TV. So for him to make a commitment to her, that would mean he'd have to stop watching something that he usually would watch. And finally, she talked him into it, and she said, please, you know, just for me this one time. And he said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do it, you know. So he made the, the commitment to do it. So that Friday night came, net 95 it was time, he goes over, he dials in the satellite, he dials in the channel, and they sit back and they watch net 95. And when it's all over with, she turns to him and she says, well, you know, like you would expect, she says, well, how did you like it? And he said, well, you know, it was okay. He said, it wasn't bad for a church program. He said, but you, you, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not interested. I don't even believe in God, and I'm not really into this stuff. He said, so, you know, it's just, I'm sorry, he said, but it's, it's just not my thing. So he gets up and he walks over to the satellite receiver, and he, he tries to dial in a different satellite, and it won't move. It's stuck. It's stuck on that satellite, and he can't change channels either. It's stuck on that channel. So he, the next morning, he gets up and he calls the, the satellite company to talk to a repair person, and the repairman comes on the line, and he says, my satellite uh, froze last night. He said, I checked everything out. He said, I took my manuals out. I, I checked everything I could check, and it will not move. It won't change satellites, and it won't change channels. Can you, can you fix that? He said, well, probably. He said, but... You have to understand that he said, I'm the only repairman for this entire county. And he said, he said, I can't possibly get to you for three or four weeks. <laughs> so the only thing that this TV addict could watch for a month was Net 95. <laughs> and, and his wife said that he was so desperate to watch TV, not only did he watch the, the live broadcast, but he watched the reruns too. <laughs> and so after Net 95 was over, I had the privilege of baptizing him. He had, he had become a believer. He had accepted Jesus as his Savior and had accepted the truths of the Adventist church. And I baptized him. And on the next day, which would have been Sunday, of course, when he woke up, he got up with this thought. He told me later, he said, I wonder if God set me up. <laughs> so he gets up and he goes into his living room and he, he tries to adjust the satellite to see if it'll move, and sure enough, everything worked perfectly. So his testimony was, his testimony was, God loves you so much, he will even set you up if that's what it takes to get you in the kingdom. Isn't that something? Amen. True story to the very detail. God heard our prayers for that person. I have no doubt in my mind that that miracle would not have taken place if we had not prayed. Do you agree with that? Amen. Now let's talk about praying for healing. This is something that a couple of you have requested, especially that we talk about. And so I'm happy to do that with you this morning. In James chapter 5, verse, verse 16, it's very clear. It says, pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it's, it says, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we looked at that a couple of days ago, that the Bible says in Romans 3, verse 10, that I have no righteousness. You have no righteousness. Do, do we agree on that? Amen. We, none of, now, see, you've already forgotten how to say amen. Now, how, how did that happen in 24 hours? I don't know. So, the Bible says that we have no righteousness, amen? amen? But yet it says the prayer of a righteous man avails much, okay? Now, the Catholic idea, and I say this with respect, the Catholic idea is that everything goes through the priest, okay? Catholicism has had a huge impact on the, on the thinking of Christians, and a lot of people think that unless you're a pastor, then you, you, you know it's kind of hit and miss if God's going to hear your prayers. Or if you're somehow you know, not an ordained person, that maybe God can't hear your prayers. That's Catholic theology. That is not Bible theology. The Bible says in, in Matthew 10, verse 8, it says, it says, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, raise the dead. Freely you have received, freely give. And he's talking to all of you. Every single one of you has the has the same privilege in prayer that I have or that anybody else has. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. We're all on equal footing at the foot of the cross. You know, all of us are, are the same. You know, I just happen to receive a salary so that I can, I can preach and, and uh, give Bible studies and visit people full time. That's the only difference between you and me. In fact, when the conference presidents came to our college way back in the last millennium, and they were speaking to us about, about the possibility of becoming pastors, one, one of them said to me, so he said, Kevin, so suppose 
you don't get a call. Supposing you don't get called to ministry, what will you do? And I said, well, I guess I'll go back and work in construction or work on the farm, and I will, I will preach and give Bible studies in my spare time because that's what I felt called to do. And I said, I will do it as much as God allows me to do. The salary just lets me do it full time. That's the only difference. In fact, if something should happen to the organization of this church and suddenly the paychecks all stop, it wouldn't change who I am and what I believe and it wouldn't change what I want to do. I would still be a Seventh-day Adventist. I would still believe the truth of the Bible. I would still want to preach and I would still want to give Bible studies. You know, that, that wouldn't change. So when I think about each of us and what our, our status is with God, the Bible says that there is no male, female, there is no Greek, there is no Jew. It says we are all one in Christ. Amen? We are all one in Christ. And, and God can move on any person to preach the gospel, to, to give Bible studies, or to do whatever it is he wants them to do. And so each of us can pray, and we can all pray with equal authority and equal power because we all go through Christ, and he is the righteous man. And when we pray, he prays. We looked at that a couple of days ago. And when he prays, he's the righteous man, and, and the prayers of a righteous man avails much. Isn't that good news? Amen. So it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, that if we ask according to his will, he will hear us. Now, when it comes to asking for spiritual things, like forgiveness or the gift of eternal life, that's always a yes. When you come to God and you ask for spiritual things, there is absolutely no doubt it's a yes. Lord, forgive me, he forgives you. Lord, save me, he saves you. Accept me and come into my heart, he comes into your heart. It's a yes every time. When it comes to physical things... We pray like Jesus did in the garden, like it mentions there on the screen. It says Matthew 26, uh, verse 39, I think it is, that I wrote down there. And that's Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And what was he praying about? He was praying about his physical life. He said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Because just like all of us, he, he wasn't wanting to die. His humanity wasn't wanting to die. But he was willing to make that sacrifice for the good of the kingdom, for the salvation of souls. And so Jesus prayed to the Father. He said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So when it comes to physical things, like, like your life, your health, uh, money, uh, a job, or whatever physical thing you're talking about, we always pray, your will be done. Because it may not be God's will for us to have certain things that we think are good for us. Because like Paul said there in 1 Corinthians 13, we see through a glass, what? Darkly. We don't see well when it comes to the spiritual realities and how things affect us in this world. And sometimes what we think is really a good thing would turn out to be a bad thing. But that's why we submit to him and we say, your will be done. It's any, any parent or grandparent knows that sometimes your children ask you for things that they think they really, really want, but you know it's not a good thing. And so you try to explain it to them, you try to reason with them, but have you ever noticed that sometimes when you try to reason with a child, they're not very receptive? You ever notice that? And they go, but I want it. Don't you understand? I want it. You know? And they cry and they sometimes throw a fit. And you have to sometimes be firm and say, I don't care how much you want it. It's not going to happen because this is not for you. And someday, and kids hate to hear this, and someday when you have children, you'll understand. Now, don't tell me you never said that to your kids. And they hate to hear that. But it's true, isn't it? Isn't it true? Yeah, it's true. And so God, our Heavenly Father, we come to Him and we think we have just perfect knowledge. This has got to be God's will and it's got to happen this way because it's a no-brainer and, you know, God's got to do it. And so we're just so sure that God is going to do this because, 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 because. And then if He doesn't do it, then we get all depressed or upset even with God because it didn't happen the way I was sure God would do it in this case. Now that happened, that's happened to me several times. And I can tell you uh, this particular one, and I shared this story with the folks at Hendersonville, but this, this fella, his name was Chris, and Chris was a Samoan. And I, at the time, the church I was pastoring, we had about 25 or 30 
people who were Samoan that were attending that church. And I was helping them to establish their own Samoan church, okay? So I was involved with these folks. We had a great time. Listen, those Samoan people, they know how to play volleyball. If you ever want to have a rousing game of volleyball, you just invite a bunch of Samoans and you'll have the game of your life, okay? These people really know how to play volleyball. So, so we, every, you know, pretty much every Saturday night in the wintertime, we'd open up the gym and we'd have a lot of fun with that. And Chris and I became good friends. I was just a little bit older than him, maybe two or three years older than he was. Fine, fine Christian man. Oh, he loved the Lord, and he, people, the people in that little community, that little Samoan community, they kind of looked to him as a spiritual leader. He was, he was the heartbeat of that group. They just loved him, and he was a very strong influence on those people. Well, I was at camp meeting in that conference, and I received a message from the messenger for, for the campgrounds, and on it it said, go to the hospital immediately. Chris is in very bad condition, not expected to live. And I thought, what happened? So, man, I took off. I got in my car. I drove to the hospital. Sure enough, here he was. He was in intensive care. And I, when I went into the intensive care area, here he was surrounded by about 20, and that's no exaggeration, about 20 Samoan people there. About half of them were not Christians. I knew those people. About half of them had not given their life to the Lord. They were not Christian. But the other half were. They were Adventists. And so they, had, they, they brought me in there and they said, Pastor. And they grabbed onto me. And they, I mean, they literally grabbed onto me. And they pulled me right in there by his bedside. And they said, Pastor, pray for him now. Pray for him now. He is so sick. And they kind of had the Catholic idea that, that, the, that the pastor sort of had a direct line with God. And that, uh, you know, he might not hear our prayers, but he's going to hear... The pastor's prayer, okay, very Catholic idea. So they pulled me in there, and I'm right there by the bedside, and I took hold of his, his hand, and uh, the doctors had said that he was very gravely ill, and they didn't know why, and they were trying to figure it out, but his life was ebbing away quickly. And so, oh, I prayed. I prayed with every ounce of feeling and, and passion and fervency, that, and I didn't have to make myself that way. I loved this man as a brother. And he was really ill. And I just prayed with all my heart, tears flowing down my cheeks. I just wanted him to, go out, to get well. And in my mind, I thought, this has got to be God's will. Because here's all these unbelievers standing around this bedside. And as soon as they see that God hears and answers prayer, then they're going to turn to the Lord. Now, that's logical, right? Please tell me I wasn't illogical. Okay, that's logical, right? Okay, so... I'm thinking, this is definitely a time when God is going to do something special. I mean, how could he not? So I'm praying and praying and praying like that, and nothing happened, and he died. He died. Within a, an hour, he died. And I felt like an absolute failure. And I was kind of upset with God. Do you ever get upset with God? Yes. I was upset with God. I admit it. The prophets were upset with God. If you ever read the book Habakkuk, Habakkuk was, was hotter than a griddle. He was, he was really upset with God. And he was saying, how can you do this? How can you let this happen? And he was so upset with God. God isn't offended by us being honest with him and telling him how we feel. Now, you should always be respectful. But he, you might as well tell him how you feel because he knows anyway. Isn't that true? Yeah, it's true. And so I told him, I said, how could you let this happen? This is terrible. Now, what are these people going to think? They're going to think that you don't care. They're going to think that you don't have any power. They're going to think that you don't do what the Bible says. They're going to think that the Bible is, is, is crazy and that it's just stories. And, and like he said to me several times, I can remember he said to me, look, he said, this is my reputation. This is not your reputation. This is my reputation. Let me handle things. I know what I'm doing. Did you know that God knows what he's doing? I just thought I'd mention that in case it's a surprise to you. God, God knows what he's doing, okay? And so I had to submit, and I said, yeah, okay, okay, I know. You. But I, I'm, I'm still not happy about this. And I was totally amazed a few days later when the phone rang, and the head of the Samoan community called me. They have, they have kings. Did you know that in Samoa they have kings and royalty? And so this fellow called me. He's a king, among the Samoan people, and I, I knew him, and he, he called me up and he said, Pastor, 
He said, we would like you to be the speaker for Chris's funeral. Now, in the Samoan community, they have several things, and it goes on for several days. They'll have three or four days of awake kind of an idea. But they have one person in particular at one point in that wake process when they all get together and they listen to this person. And they wanted me to do that. And I was shocked. I thought, why would they ask me to do that? I'm a failure. My, God didn't hear my prayers for, for Chris at a pivotal moment. So why would they ask me to do that? I, I totally was, I was just totally, completely shocked. And I didn't know what to say, but how could I not say yes? I mean, after everything that had happened. So I said, I said, it would be an honor to do that. I said, are you sure? I even asked him, I said, are you sure you want me to do that? He said, it was unanimous. We all want you to do it. There was no, nobody else that we wanted to do this. We want you to do it. I said, okay. So I prayed, prayed, prayed. I thought, you know, I thought, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'll do the best I know to do. And so I went to that service and when I got there, they said, now, Pastor, we are Samoans. We are not white people. So you preach as long as you want to, because we are here all day. <laughs> and I'd never had anybody say that to me before. It, it sort of felt liberating, you know? It almost felt intoxicating. And, 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 I, and I, said, I said, wow, you know? I said, are you sure? They said, yes, you preach two hours, three hours, four hours, we don't care. And I thought, wow, this is, this is definitely culture shock. So, but as hard as I try, I couldn't go more than an hour. So, you know. So I, anyway, I preached. And when it was all over with, then there's this big dinner. So we, we were having dinner. And several, not all, but several of those people who had been around the bedside of Chris that day when I came in and I prayed for him, came to me, and here's what they said. They said, Pastor Kevin, we have I have decided, they didn't come to me together, they came one at a time at different times, and again, not all of them, but several said, I have decided to give my life to Jesus. And they said, I want you to know that the reason I decided to give my life to Jesus was because I was so moved by how much you loved him. And they said, when I saw how much you loved him, I realized that that's how much Jesus loves me. And so I've decided I want to give my life to a God like that. Now, you know, his ways, he says, are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And you know, there's that story about Samson how he killed this many people when he was living, he killed that many people when he was living. And it says, though, that he slew more of the Lord's enemies in his death than he did in his life. God knows what he's doing. And as hard as it is for us to accept sometimes, he works through pain and sorrow and difficulty, sometimes more effectively than he can work through a miracle of life or health. Isn't that something? I mean, hey, I'm like you. I always want a yes answer, don't you? Well, here, here are three different studies that were done on prayer and healing. And these were done in medical institutions. And they took these, the, one in 88, one in 99, and one in 2001. And these were all blind studies. That means they prayed for people who knew they were being prayed for, and they prayed for people who did not know that they were being prayed for. You follow me? And the results were the same. Whether people knew they were being prayed for or whether the people didn't know they were being prayed for, they got well quicker and had less complications after surgery and healed uh, more healing, better healing in their life, the people who were prayed for. So even scientifically speaking, intercessory prayer makes a big difference when you are praying for people. And I believe that even when somebody dies, God, in answer to prayer, moves in the life of that person and makes their passing more peaceful because of the prayers of God's people. Amen. Now, here is a quote for you from prayer, page 174, the book prayer, compilation of Ellen White's writings on prayer. She says, I was shown that in case of sickness, where the way is clear for the offering up of prayer for the sick, the case should be committed to the Lord in calm faith, not with a storm of excitement, 
He alone is acquainted with the past life of the individual and knows what his future will be. He who is acquainted with the hearts of all men knows whether the person, if raised up, will glorify his name or dishonor him by backsliding and apostasy. All that we are required to do is to ask God to raise the sick up, if in accordance with his will, believing that he hears the reasons which we present and the fervent prayers offered. If the Lord sees it will best honor him, he will answer our prayers, but to urge recovery without submission to his will is not right. So see, sometimes it isn't best for a person to be made well. Sometimes it is actually better if they go to sleep in Jesus. Now let me share these verses with you. Uh, in Isaiah 57, and I'd like you to go ahead and take your Bible out and turn there. Isaiah 57. Notice what it says there, Isaiah 57, verse 1 and 2. It says, The righteous perish, and no one ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from what? From evil. And then it says, Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. Sometimes, you see, the Lord knows, and that's where 1 Corinthians 10, 13 comes in. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that the Lord will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will make the way of escape. Now, I've seen some terrible losses in my life. I remember coming to an elders meeting and getting a phone call as soon as I got to the church that the 30-year-old son of one of our elders had just suddenly died from a heart attack. 30 years old, just, was just dropped dead from a heart attack. Turned out he had a congenital heart problem that nobody knew that he was born with. It was a ticking time bomb, and it just it went off when he was 30, and he, he passed away. Tra terrible tragedy. Can you imagine the, to lose someone that vital and that young in such a quick, unexpected way. It was a shock to everybody. He was a godly young man. And then I can remember another case where there was uh, a family that lost a baby to SIDS, a SIDS death. Beautiful people, loved the Lord, and this little infant, just a little over a year old, died suddenly in, the, in it, his sleep. And they laid him to rest. It was very tearful, very sad thing, but they had, they believed in God. They believed there must be a reason. There must be a purpose. And there's a lot of things like this that we will not understand until Jesus comes. There just isn't any way to explain it. We can talk about sin in the world. We can talk about, uh, you know, how the devil works and all of that is true. And I would never take away from the truthfulness of that. And yet we have to be honest and say, God is in control. Yes. He's in control. And if he allows something to happen, then he had a hand in this. Now, I know among Adventists, there's, they like to say, the Lord didn't do that. The Lord didn't do that. All right? The devil did that. And for a lot of people, it makes them feel better to say that the devil did that and not God. But that's not what Job said, is it? Job said, the Lord gave. And what? And the Lord took, takes away. Now listen, if, if your little boy ran out into the street and I was standing right there and your little boy ran out in the street, I'm standing right there and I see this truck coming and I stand back and let that truck hit your little boy when I could have grabbed him and pulled him away, am I responsible? Yes. Partly. Aren't I partly responsible? And how are you going to feel about me if you see that happen? You, you saw that I could have reached out and yanked him out of the street, but I did nothing. You'd have some difficulty with me, wouldn't you? Yes, yes you would. And that's why Jesus died on the cross, because he takes the responsibility. Now, now I remember this, I, till the day I die, I will feel the injustice that happened to me about this. I was about 10 and we lived in Arkansas at the time, and my father had bought me a BB gun, a BB rifle, a little air rifle, okay? Now, he had, he had taught me how to use it, sternly showed me, you know, what to avoid, and I, listen, I, I liked being able 
to have my air rifle, and I was obedient to God or to my, to my father in this respect. I can't say I was always obedient to my father, okay? But I was obedient to my father to the detail with this. And I did not shoot my BB gun here and there and everywhere. I was very careful about what I was supposed to do because I didn't want to lose it. He told me I'd lose it if I did something like that. So one day I was out in my backyard practicing shooting tin cans that I would set up on a log and there was a fence just like my dad had shown me to do. And so I was shooting those, those little cans, you know, and I looked up and I saw two boys walking down the street with their BB guns, shooting at whatever. And I would shoot my cans and I watched these two boys and as they were walking down the street, they stopped in front of my neighbor lady's house and they looked at her big plate glass window. And I saw them go bing, 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 bing. And then they tore off running, ran away. I thought, wow, they're gonna get in trouble. So after they left, neighbor lady comes through the living room, she sees her window. She sees it full of BBs, you know, BB holes. And she sees me in my backyard shooting my BB gun. So what did she think? She thought, I, she was sure, she caught me red-handed, she thought. So that night, when my dad came home, she talked to him, then he talked to me. And he could tell when I was lying and when I was telling the truth. And I said to him, Dad, I did not do that. I, there were two boys walking down the street. I saw them do it. I didn't do that. And he knew I was telling the truth. And he even said so. He said, I believe you. He said, I'm, I'm sure you didn't do it. I can tell. He said, but you know something? I'm still going to have to pay for that window. Because she's sure you did it. And I said, I said, that's not fair. He said, no, it's not fair, but it's right. He said, it's the right thing to do. And so he paid for her to have a new window installed in her home. Now see, God... It's not fair that he's blamed for everything that the devil does. But he also can't prevent everything the devil does because of all the factors involved. And so he pays for it anyway. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross. Because no matter what happens, whenever you begin to doubt God's love and care for you, when something didn't go the way you wished it would go, then I would urge you to look to Jesus on the cross and then ask yourself, how much does God love you? Amen. He loves you so much that he gave his only son so that you would not perish, but that you would have everlasting life. And someday, you will have the answers, the more detailed answers that you need so that you can be at peace. That's what the millennium is about. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wander. Why it should be thus all the day long While there are others living about us Never molested though in the wrong Farther along we'll know all about it Farther along we'll understand why Cheer up, my brothers, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we shall meet him in that bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Farther along we'll know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brothers, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. In Deuteronomy 34, verses 4 to 6, you have the passing of Moses. And it says there that the Lord said, Moses, I can't let you go into the promised land. He had prayed, Lord, please forgive me for hitting that rock twice. I'm sorry I did that. Please forgive me. 
Please let me go into the promised land. I've worked so hard. I've tried to be, to be good. I've tried to do what you wanted me to do. Please. And he said, I can't let you do it, Moses. I'm sorry. Can't let you do it. Moses was disappointed. But he obeyed. He was submissive. And the Bible says he laid down his life. He went to sleep. And the Bible says that the Lord buried him and buried him in such a way that nobody could ever find his grave, which was smart on God's part because there'd be a gigantic shrine built over his grave now and everybody would be going there worshiping Moses. So, no, you know, they, he, he buried him in an obscure, undetectable manner. Nobody could ever find his resting place. And then not long after that, the Lord had a surprise. He came down to this earth and he called Moses and the, Michael the archangel was there according to Jude. And the Lord said to Moses, Arise. And can you imagine Moses' delight when the Lord said, Sorry I couldn't take you to the promised land here on earth, but how about a different promised land? Will that work okay? <laughs> and Moses was delighted, you know. I'm sure his eyes just sparkled. And he said, Oh yeah, this is, this is way better. I'll take this, you know. I like the way Juanita Kretschmar put it. She said, God, you might want to write this down, God always reserves the best for those who leave the choice with him. He always reserves the best for those who leave the choice with him. So I was in my office one day in a, in a church where I was at, and the phone rang, and it was a family. They said, are you the pastor of the Adventist church? I said, yes. They said, we have just lost our 18-year-old son in a car accident. I had read about in the paper two boys in a Nissan. They were good kids. They were good boys. The paper talked about how they were service-oriented in their community, and they were friends, hung out together. And they had just been to a place where they had been uh, enjoying a, a school party that was chaperoned. And everything was good. And they were on their way home, and a drunk driver uh, hit them and literally cut that Nissan in half, and both of those boys were killed instantly, and they were mangled to the point that it was a closed coffin service. And so they said, would you do the service? And I thought, wow, you know, they had some Adventist connections somewhere. They weren't really going to church anywhere, but they had some connection with the Adventist church, and they asked me to do this service, and I knew this was going to be a gigantic, huge service, two, three, four hundred people crowding into that place. And, you know, the entire senior class was there, and a bunch of the other kids from the school were there, from the high school, and teachers were there, and, and people from the community, and, of course, family, and personal friends. And it was the biggest funeral I've ever done. It was the biggest funeral, just huge. And I knew it was going to be that way, and I was praying, 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 praying. And, and, and this... I always do this. Every funeral I ever do, I always pray that God will resurrect the person. So if you're ever any place where I'm doing a funeral and you see me close my eyes when I'm on the platform, you know what I'm doing. I'm asking the Lord if it be his will to resurrect that person. And someday it's going to happen. Someday it's going to happen. So I always pray for that. Always I have because I believe in the resurrection. And I think God can resurrect people now. I believe that. And so if he wants to, of course, it would create a media nightmare. Do you realize that? If God resurrected somebody like that, I mean, if, if you hear this banging on the coffin, you know, and you open the coffin and this person gets out, everybody in the church is going to faint dead away to start with. And then after that, every major news network in the whole world is going to be carrying the story. And then it's going to be all over the Internet, and half the people will say, wow, wasn't that an amazing miracle? And the other half are going to say, you're crazy. It was staged. It wasn't true. It's Hollywood. I mean, my grandmother said that about when they put people on the moon. She said, oh, they didn't go to the moon. That's Hollywood, you know. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> that's what people do. So even though somebody was raised from the dead, Jesus said, even if they rise from the dead, they still won't believe, but I still pray for it anyway. So when this young man died, I thought, wow, wouldn't that be a witness to the community? So I went to the funeral home, and I met the funeral home director, and uh, he said, how can I help you? I said, would you please take me to the room where the young man is? He said, yes. He said, but we are not doing any viewings because the family has requested that the casket remain closed. I said, well, that's okay. I didn't come to, to view him anyway. He said, well, 
what, what are you here for? And I kind of inwardly kind of hesitated and gulped, and I said, I'm here to pray for him that if it's God's will, that he will resurrect him. You should have seen the look on that man's face. <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure when I saw the look on his face whether he felt sorry for me or whether he was shocked or what, but he was professional, and he said, well, sure. And then he said, can I come with you? And I said, absolutely. And so we went down the hall and went to the room where the casket was at. And I went inside and I knelt down. I put my hand on the casket and oh, I prayed with all my heart. I did. I prayed with all my heart. And, and, when, and when my heart is just kicking in that heart, I can't help but the tears flow. And I, I was just praying, praying, praying for the, for the glory of God and for the mercy of the family and for a witness to the community. And I just prayed and I asked in the name of Jesus, that if it would be his will, that he would resurrect that young man. And it didn't happen. And when, when there was no resurrection there, you know, I stood up and I felt a little self-conscious. I felt a little embarrassed. Maybe I shouldn't, but I, I did. And I didn't quite know how this man would react. I didn't know what he would say. Uh, I didn't know if he'd be condescending or what. But when we stood up, he shook my hand, and then he took his other hand, he grabbed my arm like this. He said, I want to shake your hand. He said, you're the first Christian I ever met who really believes in the resurrection. He said, everybody talks about it, but he said, I've never really seen anybody believe it. He said, but you believe it. I said, yeah, I believe it. And he said, don't feel bad. He's still holding my hand like that. He said, don't feel bad that this young man wasn't resurrected. He said, I was resurrected. Wow. He said, your prayer has brought me back to Christ. Wow. He said, from this day forward, I will be a Christian, and I will serve the Lord. God has a plan, brothers and sisters. You don't know what he's doing. You don't know why he's doing it. But trust, like the song says, when you, when you can't see his hand, trust his plan. He has a plan. He knows what he's doing. We all went under the tree and sat down to look at the glory of the place when brethren Fitch and Stockman who had preached the gospel of the kingdom and whom God had laid in the grave to... Are you reading it with me? God laid him in the grave to what? To save them. Came up to us and asked us what we had passed through while they were sleeping. We tried to call up our greatest trials, but they looked so small compared with the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that surrounded us that we could not speak them out and we all cried out, Alleluia! Heaven is cheap enough. And we touched our glorious harps and made heaven's arches ring. You know, when we all get to heaven, it isn't going to matter how old we were when we died. Is it? It's not going to matter. Some of us died when we were young, very young. Some of us will die when we're very old. But after two or three hundred years goes by, what difference does it make? It doesn't make any difference, does it? No. Because... You know, a hundred years from now, all of us here, if time lasts that long, which I can't conceive of, but if it did, we're all going to be in the grave, every one of us, because that's the way of humanity. The only thing that matters, really, that matters, is that we have Jesus. If we have Jesus, then we have life, 1 John 5, 12. And life here on this earth, no matter how long it is, is always too short. Would you agree with that? I, I've been to the bedsides of lots of people who were passing away, and I can't think of any of them that wouldn't have liked to have had another year or two. Life is always too short. We weren't meant to, to die this young. We weren't meant to die at all. God had a different plan, and, it, and we're dealing with a mess down here, and he's trying to take care of it as best he knows how. Okay, let's, let's finish up real quick here talking about praying for the lost. Again, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, it says that when we pray, people are saved. In Luke twenty two thirty two, 32, Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. In, Jer in Joshua 24, 15, he tells us why praying for people to, to straighten up and get their life figured out and become Christian, why, why it's so hard. Because people have a brain. They have the power of choice, and they make the final decision as to whether they will follow Jesus or not. I like to say you'd have better luck praying for a fence post than you have praying for a person, because praying for a person is the hardest prayer of all, because people have brains, and they get stubborn, and they get selfish, and they get strong-minded, and they say, I'm going to do this, and I don't want to do that. And so, but when you pray for somebody, it puts influence on them. It, it, it helps. It, it puts a, a strong 
influence on them. I'd like you to imagine that I have a person standing here that is lost. He's not, he, he, he's not going to heaven at this point. He's lost, okay? And on this side is the devil tugging on him this way. Keep following me. And on this other side is the angel of the Lord tugging on him saying, follow me and, and come to Jesus. Well, when you pray, it enables the angel to tug a little harder. Now, I know that's a, a simplistic illustration, but that's what the Bible teaches us, is that when you pray, greater influence is placed on that child to, to follow the Lord, that child or that grandchild. And the way I like to think of it is I can't, I can't tuck my kids into bed at night like I used to. I used to sing them songs and read them stories and tuck them into bed and give them a hug and a kiss on their head, you know, and all that stuff that I just love to do. I can't do that anymore because they're in their 30s now. That would be a little weird, right? Okay, so I can't do that. But when I pray for them, when I pray for them, the angels minister to them. And I, I visualize them in my mind. I mean, it's just my own little thinking, but in my mind, I think that when I'm praying for them, the Lord is tucking them into bed. He's watching over them. He's hovering over them. He's prospering them. He's protecting them. He's guiding them. He's directing them. Lots of things happen because of prayer. Now, I'm going to pass this story, and I'm going to get to a couple of others here in a minute. But the prayers of Abraham saved his family. Amen. I mean, Lot was saved because Abraham bargained with God. True? Yep. Okay. And then Job prayed for his friends. Otherwise, the Lord was going to punish his friends. So Job prayed, and they weren't punished. And then Moses prayed for the whole nation of Israel. And because he prayed, God spared the whole nation. Right? Yes, that's true. And then Jesus in the garden, he prayed, and his prayers saved the world. Isn't that amazing? And so in the Garden of Gethsemane is, I like to, you know, we're told it would be well if we would spend a, a thoughtful hour each day on the closing scenes. Now, when, when people hear that quote, they often think I'm supposed to spend a thoughtful hour on the cross. No, she said the closing scenes. That would be the, the, the Last Supper. It would be Gethsemane. It would be the cross. And it would be the resurrection and the ascension. Those were the closing scenes in the life of Christ. So I, I, I am moved by the cross. Don't get me wrong. It does move me. And I, I, when I look at the cross, I go, wow, look what God did. That is incredible. Look what God did. But the part of the closing scenes of the life of Christ that moved me the most is Gethsemane. Because it was in Gethsemane that he slugged it out with the devil to save my soul. It was in Gethsemane that he won the battle which enabled him to give his life on the cross. He would have died in Gethsemane if the angel hadn't come and saved him. So the prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane saved the world. Now, this quote I wanted to share with you again in case some of you were new today. And I, oh, I forgot to change the page. It should be 274, Sons and Daughters of God, page 274. Jesus will add his intercession to your prayers and claim for the sinner the gift of the Holy Spirit and pour it upon his soul, and there will be joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. And that is, we find that in the sanctuary in the Bible. You have the altar of incense, the incense is rising, that according to Revelation, that's the prayers of the saints. Then the, the priest would come in with the blood of the sacrifice, and he would mingle his intercession with the prayers of the saints. So she's simply saying in detail what the Bible is picturing there for you in the sanctuary. Jesus will add his intercession to your prayers. So when you pray for someone, Jesus prays for that person at the same time. Yes, that's important. When you pray for your children, Jesus turns to the Father, and he, he spreads out his nail-pierced hands, and he cries out, Father, my blood. And he pleads his, the blood of his sacrifice on behalf of your children. When you pray for your grandchildren, the same thing. Now, when I was a kid going uh, through public school, I had many opportunities to get involved in many different things. Uh, kids offered me this and that, that, you know, bad stuff, or to do things, go places. And I always said no, every single time. I wasn't a Christian. I had no reason to say no. A, lot of, a big part of me wanted to say yes, but I always said no. I mean, most kids like to get in with their friends and do stupid stuff, you know, and I was no exception, but every single time I said no. I said no to cigarettes, said no to booze, said no to drugs, said no to secret parties, said no to all that stuff. Weird, right? Then I became a Christian. 
when I was 17. And a few years later, after I'd studied quite a bit about prayer, it dawned on me, somebody was praying for me. Amen. So I asked my oldest sister, her name is Joyce, she's 14 years older than me, I asked her, I said, Joyce, when, it, when we kids were growing up, was there somebody praying for us? Because I couldn't remember my mom and dad praying that much. She said, oh yeah. She said, there was. I said, who was praying for us? She said, Grandma. I said, how do you know that? She said, because I was in her home one time, and she said to me, Joyce, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do today, but i got to go pray first. She said, oh, I'll go with you, Grandma. She said, no. She said, I don't think you really want to. She said, you might want to do something for a while. She said, it's going to take me a while. And she said, what do you mean? My, my sister said, what do you mean? She says, well, I've got a lot of people to pray for, and it, and it takes me an hour and sometimes maybe two at times. She said, I'll be in, in my room there for, for quite a little while. She said, so maybe you should busy yourself and do something. She said, Grandma, I want to come with you. And she said, well, okay, but don't feel like you have to stay. She said, all right. So she went with my grandma and knelt with her by her bedside, and Grandma poured out her heart in the Lord in prayer and mentioned by name different people. She started with her family. And, she, and Joyce said she prayed for each of us kids by name, in detail, every single day. And she said she prayed that God would keep us healthy and strong and that he would save us and that he would keep us from evil. And she pled with all her heart that God would save us and keep us from evil in this world. I don't have any question that my grandma's prayers is why I said no. That's why I said no. There was no other reason. That's why I said no. You, when you pray for people, it puts a hedge about them, and it causes them to think about things they wouldn't think about otherwise. So brothers and sisters, don't stop praying for your kids and your grandkids. Don't stop praying for the people you care about. It's making a difference in their life. Now, I shared a different story with Hendersonville. I want to share this. Uh, if you look at this picture, these are my kids. Uh, on the far right is Jim, my son-in-law. He's married to my daughter, Carrie, in the blue top there. And then next to her is Heidi. She's the wife of our youngest son, Keith, who's hugging her there. And then that's our son, Kyle, and his wife, Margie, is not in this picture. And I, when I was at Hendersonville, I talked about Kyle, but I want to tell you this story about Jim and Carrie. So one morning, it was the Sunday morning of my wife's parents' 50th anniversary. They're just about to celebrate their 60th anniversary, so this was 10 years ago. And when we were there nearby, there, uh, where they lived, we happened to live about an hour from where they lived at the time, where I was pastoring a church, and we had agreed that we were going to show up at their home at a certain time, and, and a lot of us were getting together to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Well, our daughter and her husband lived three hours to the north, so they had to get up earlier and get, get to driving uh, before the rest of us did. Now, up north there where they lived, there was a big heavy rain. You remember that big heavy rain we had a couple nights ago? You know, that just poured like that? Well, it poured and poured and poured like that, and they lived it, at the time it was Spokane, Washington. Now, Spokane is a city that is in bad need of money for infrastructure. And the people on the east side of Washington are always complaining because most of the money goes to the west side where Seattle is. So people over in Spokane are saying, hey, you know, we need some of that money over here too. The freeways get ruts in them because of all the traffic that goes by there. And the, so the freeways had these big ruts in them. And I'm talking, you know, they were probably, you know, two or three inches deep, th these ruts that they had in the freeway. So after all that heavy rain, what happened to the, to the ruts? They filled up with what? water. And on that morning, they were driving, and, and the, the roads didn't have as many ruts on the left side, on the, on the left lane of the freeway, because most of the truck traffic, of course, stays on the right. So to avoid all that water, our son Jim and daughter Carrie were driving in their S10 pickup on the way to go down to Walla Walla, Washington, where we were having the, the uh, anniversary celebration. And they, had, they, were, they were driving through Spokane on the left side, and being careful, Jim's always been a great driver, and along comes this fella in another car, and he's going way too fast. And he's in the right lane, and he begins to hydroplane, and he loses control of his vehicle, and he ends up smashing in to Jim and Carrie, and pushes, pushes them up on the meridian. 
So they had two wheels on the concrete meridian like this, and they're driving diagonally like that. He's trying very hard to, to keep control of this truck and you know, quickly trying to figure out what to do. And he tries to ease it off of, the, of that concrete meridian back onto the, to the pavement. And when he did so, somehow, you know, in the process of doing that, the front right bumper caught the pavement. And when that happened, the truck flipped end for end a couple of times and then laid on its side and rolled over several times off to the side of the road. Now that morning, when I was having my prayer time, I was praying through all of the people, and I, was, I did just like Grandma. I started with my wife, and then I started praying for each of our children. And when I got to Carrie, our, our daughter, the Lord said to me very clearly in my heart, he said, keep praying for Carrie. She needs your prayers. Keep praying for her. So I prayed, I prayed, and I prayed. And the burden was still there. I kept praying. It, I prayed for her for 30 minutes. Just for her alone, I prayed for her for 30 minutes, and that burden kept resting heavily on my heart, and I kept praying, and finally the burden lifted, and it was like the Lord said, it's okay now. What I didn't know was that Jim's father, at that very moment, had been impressed to pray too, and he, had been, he was praying at exactly the same time I was praying, with the same burden, and he prayed for the same amount of time until the burden lifted. So both of us fathers were praying for these children at the same time, and we didn't know it until later. So what happened was, is when that truck flipped, the, the passenger side of the truck where my daughter had been sitting was crushed clear down to the window well, just completely crushed all the way down. The, the cab went like this, like a sharp pyramid, and it went, the, the, the left side of the cab where Jim was, uh, was basically intact, but it sharply declined down to the door on the right side. If my daughter had remained seated in that seat where she was, she would have died for sure. But she said, Dad, I felt a hand push me into Jim. Pushed me, shoved me right into him hard. And she said, when everything came to a standstill, we were both crowded into that one little corner of that pickup. The back window was broken out, of course, and that's what enabled them to crawl out. No broken bones, no internal injuries, no no significant injury, a couple of bruises, and Jim had a small little cut on his cheek. And other than that, that was it. Everybody who stopped, and, and they all thought that surely they, whoever was in that truck had died. And when they saw those kids come crawling out of that truck, they could not believe their eyes. There, there's absolutely no question that taking the time to pray that morning saved my daughter's life. Amen. It wasn't just my prayers, it was others. It was Jim's prayer, his father's prayers, but... We, we must pray for one another. It's important that we spend time praying for the people in our life. Jesus is praying for us. He is our example. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Let prayer be the expression of your life. Let prayer be your most important thing you do each day. Let prayer be the thing you turn to first and not your last resort. Let prayer guide you and always keep your eyes on Jesus. Do not lose your confidence in Christ. Do not lose your confidence in the Bible. Do not lose your confidence in the mission and the destiny of this church. Trust Jesus for your salvation. Commit your life to him in obedience. Follow him all the days of your life. And you will never regret one moment, one hour that you spend in prayer. It's been a privilege for me to meet with you this week. I have enjoyed getting acquainted with you. And I hope with all my heart that very, very soon we will all get to greet one another on that great getting up morning. I'd like you to stand with me for prayer. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. In my heart. In my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Lord, I want 
to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Lord, I want to be more prayerful in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be more prayerful in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be in my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.